Thomas Levy is a board-certified cardiologist and a lawyer. He is the author of 10 other groundbreaking medical books, including Curing the Incurable, Vitamin C, Infectious Diseases and Toxins, Primal Panacea, and Death by Calcium. He is one of the leading vitamin C experts in the world, and he frequently lectures at medical conferences and to groups of people around the globe about the proper role of vitamin C and other antioxidants in optimizing treatment protocols for the most chronic degenerative diseases, including heart disease, cancer, and advanced chronic infections such as Lyme. Well, Dr. Levy, you are an overachiever. We can, you are unbelievable. Um, and then speaking with Dr. Levy too, he's a very interesting person. He's a wealth of information. I want to take up his time, but the IBDM is proud to have him speak at our meeting. Dr. Levy. Hello. And also the book. Um, Dr. Levy is um, generous, very generous. He is giving away free copies of his book, Hidden Epidemic. He'll sign it for you. It's over at the Live On Labs desk, so please feel free to drop by. Say hi to Dr. Levy. He's very interesting. Thank you, sir. Dad, you have the. Uh, this okay. No. I'll take. Yet? Okay, yeah, good. I might add you have the wonderful opportunity to have an perhaps future valuable error copy of that book since they misspelled epidemic on the spine of the book. So, But you know how at the mint when they mishit a coin, it becomes valuable. So. The next run will be corrected, so get your error copy now while you can. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this whole topic began for me in January of 2016. Uh, the, the cover of the book actually depicts the patient in question, a good friend of mine. <clears throat> she was getting three root canals taken out, and I was accompanying her and they did a three-dimensional x-ray just to map out the anatomy. And I could see across the room that the last tooth, which was not root canaled, was incredibly grossly infected. But she had no symptoms, no pain, no discomfort. And I didn't need to have a brick hit me in the face to say <laughs> a tooth like that, whether it's symptomatic or not, is going to take you down. But it triggered the research that I've since done for this because I, even although I'm not a dentist, I had pretty much always gotten the impression that a grossly infected tooth with a huge periapical space was going to be symptomatic, and you'd know about it. And when I reviewed the literature, some of which I'll summarize with you in the presentation, you'll see not only is the opposite true, the vast, vast, vast majority of infected teeth are 100% asymptomatic. And I can show you the data to show that they are vastly more toxic than our old friend, the root canal treated tooth. Okay, so immediately I said, my God, this is the reason for the vast majority of heart disease, cancer, and chronic degenerative disease in the world. And when you see the incidence and prevalence that I'm going to show you, I think that'll come home. Now, uh, all of these have references. You can go to PubMed, type in the number that's cited, go straight to the article or abstract. First, I want to lay the foundation of why infected teeth are as toxic as they are. All promoters of chronic degenerative disease, 100% share a common denominator, and that's increased oxidative stress. And let me say this right now because there have been a few things that have morphed since I've last made these presentations, and I think it's much easier to understand now, and I'll go into the detail on this, that you'll see in the literature just about every disease has increased oxidative stress associated with it. Let me tell you, disease is increased oxidative stress. That's the entirety of the pathology. There is no more pathology to disease 
than which biomolecules are oxidized, where they are, and what their concentration is. But there is no other pathology to any disease than which biomolecules are oxidized. So, and the biggies are infections. Matter of fact, we'll see there is no disease that's not caused by toxins because toxins and prooxidants are synonyms in interchangeable terms. So all chronic disease is the product of increased prooxidants and decreased antioxidants. And even though this is very simple and simplistic, I'm going to tell you it's accurate and the complexity of biology comes in treating disease, not in identifying it. <clears throat> So the factors that are primary promoters, infection-related toxins, toxins unrelated to infections, environmental exposures, etc., inadequate presence of antioxidants and nutrients, and then people say, well, what about genetic diseases? Well, genetic diseases are increased oxidative stress from compromised metabolic pathways, deficient enzymes, etc., <clears throat> and then really big, hormonal deficiencies. Estrogen women, testosterone men, thyroid hormone, and everybody, they are primary regulators of your susceptibility to oxidative stress in every cell of your body. So what could be more significant than that? <clears throat> now, uh, this was defined in the literature, increased oxidative stress. Remember, there's physiological oxidative stress, too. You can't be alive without generating oxidative stress. But you generate this much oxidative stress, and when you add this much oxidative stress, you've got disease. And then when you add this much oxidative stress, you've got cancer. And then when you add this much oxidative stress, you have cell death. So increased oxidative stress can also be characterized as existing when excess levels of previously oxidized biomolecules are present. And that's where you get into chronic disease. So what do toxins and infections all have in common? They all cause cell damage and produce symptoms by increasing oxidative stress. And like I said, it's even better to think of the fact that the process of a molecule being inappropriately oxidized is the definition of disease. And these are some of the variations that can partially explain why one common pathology, increased oxidative stress, can give you, give rise to all the different pathologies, all the different diseases, okay? Where is the oxidative stress, number one? Inside the cells, outside the cells, inside the intracellular organelles, the nucleus, the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum. Number two, what are the biomolecule properties of the toxin? Now, all the toxins do the same thing. They oxidize, but cyanide will kill you in 30 seconds. Mercury will kill you in 30 years but they all cause oxidative stress. Cyanide just happens to poison the enzymes that assimilate oxygen, and you starve of oxygen in a minute. The genetic predispositions, is the stress acute or chronic? Is the stress huge, moderate, or minimal? <clears throat> it's also good to as we go into the dental aspects, which turn out to be the single most important significant cause of disease on the planet, is nutrients and antioxidants. What do they do? They donate electrons. That's it. And this is called reduction. Reduction, oxidation, redox. Believe me, everything is really based on redox biology. A nutrient, on the other hand, is an antioxidant. And when you eat quality food, the degree to which that food supports your health is only measured by the degree to which it is metabolized down 
to molecules that have an antioxidant function at the cellular level. Just about every molecule either is prone to reduce or prone to oxidize. There are very, very few things that are what I would call chemically inert. They don't, they don't take electrons in, they don't give electrons out. But all the others are variable in the degree in which they take up electrons, donate electrons, or if they're very electronically stable at both giving electrons and donating electrons, like vitamin C, then they promote electron flow. Similarly, and this is very important because I don't think it still is widely appreciated. A toxin is a prooxidant. A prooxidant is a toxin. They are synonyms. They mean the same thing. Okay? Free radical is a toxin. All of this. And it all has to do with the ability to take electrons. Now, in the case of a toxin, a toxin is especially toxic because... It has greater biochemical stability after the toxins, after the electrons are taken up. This means it takes electrons and keeps them. Vitamin C and other antioxidants have similar biochemical stabilities, either short of electrons or with electrons, so they can go back and forth. But the toxin takes and gives. The vitamin C will give and take, give and take, give and take. Not to beat a dead horse, but believe me, it's the most significant concept I have to give to you today is if a molecule, phrasing it a different way, if a molecule lacks the ability or does not have the ability to directly or indirectly cause the loss or theft of electrons from another molecule, it has no toxicity. Is it, what, say it again? Oh, okay. <laughs> if, if a given molecule does not have the ability to directly take or cause to be taken electrons away from another molecule, it has no toxicity. Period. Now, this is a long list of things, but just to give you some idea as to why, even though toxins all do the same thing, there could be such a wide clinical expression of their toxicity relates to where the toxin goes. So one thing is solubility. So one toxin is going to be water-soluble, one's going to be fat-soluble, one's going to be a little bit of both. <clears throat> Vitamin C, not as a toxin, but as an antioxidant, is especially useful because it's almost identical to glucose. And it goes everywhere in the body. And it passes the blood-brain barrier. Some toxins, for example, have a very large molecular size. So they're not going to go across the cell membrane very easily. Others have an ionic charge. Others actually develop a mass on accumulation, and this might be one of the few ways in which a toxin exerts a toxic effect, but not directly. I mean, you have things that actually accumulate to such a degree that they crowd out other, other normal biological reactions. And finally, as I said, the chemical nature of a toxin prevents redonation of the electrons that it took away which is the basic difference between an antioxidant and a reduced toxin. Because think of it, an antioxidant and a reduced toxin both have a full complement of electrons. Yet one's toxic clinically and the other is not. So, when I talk about biomolecules of the body, I'm talking about fats, sugars, structural molecules, especially enzymes, proteins, etc. They all exist in an electron deficient or an electron replete state. They either have a full set of electrons or they don't. If they don't, they're oxidized. If they do, they're reduced. Now, most biomolecules, when they're oxidized, they no longer have their function. 
a very few of them might have a reduced function, but for the most part, when you oxidize a biomolecule, it becomes dysfunctional or afunctional. So it's just an inert biomolecule not doing what it should be doing. However, if you have the capability, and this is the target of most positive therapies, no, this is the target of all positive therapies, when you're able to reduce previously oxidized biomolecules to a substantial degree, you get a positive clinical response. And when you do it to a massive degree, you get a clinical cure. Really that simple. So, reduced biomolecules, normal physiologic function, oxidized biomolecules decrease to absent physiological function. <clears throat> now we hear a lot about electricity and currents in medicine and in tissues. And these are very valid concepts because I think it's easy to see now that electrons are literally, the, not figuratively, literally the fuel on which your body and your cells run. And by extension of this, this makes vitamin C the primary electron donor in your body at any given point in time, the primary fuel on which your body runs. So a lot of times when I start talking about optimal doses of vitamin C, you know, I might say, take 10 grams a day. They say, wow. I say, well, how long do I have to do that? I say, well, how long do you plan on eating? How, do you plan on, how long do you plan on living? How long do you plan on staying healthy? That's how long you take vitamin C or the appropriate electron donors in your diet. There's a large number of them. That's, uh, I could go into that after the presentation. I got a large block of information to give you here, although I love to talk about vitamin C. So vitamin C then directly, when you have a large amount of it in your tissues in the reduced state, you actively promote electron flow. And we already know in science that there are optimal transmembrane voltages that support health. And this is basically because it's a direct reflection of what I call the redox status in your cell. What is the ratio of reduced biomolecules to the ratio of oxidized? The higher it gets, the healthier you are. The lower it gets, the sicker you are. It can't get more straightforward than that. Furthermore, not only does vitamin C and other quality antioxidants literally promote electron flow by rapid exchange, the opposite side of the coin is in excess of toxins, prooxidants in any given part of the cell blocks that flow. It's no longer exchanging. It's holding on to it. So you have the yin and the yang of redox biology inside your cells. And literally, how many biomolecules, where they are, what their concentration is, this, this is your disease. Okay, now, that's what I call my foundational material because I think it's really important. And you'll see, I believe, that everything I'm going to say makes a whole lot more sense when you put it in the context of redox biology. So based on that, what do I consider to be the primary treatment principles for all chronic degenerative disease? And I mean all. Number one, prevent or minimize new daily toxin exposure. Okay, there's environmental, there's dental, which we're going to talk a lot about. There's dietary and digestive. When you have a screwed up digestion, you start nurturing and producing the literally same type of toxic bacteria in your gut that you have inside a root canal. So someone who has really lousy digestion has a giant root canal in their gut. And it's not solved by organic food. It's solved by proper digestion. 
if you eat McDonald's every day and you digest it perfectly, you're going to have less toxicity coming from your gut than if you eat a perfect organic diet and digest it poorly. That's how toxic the toxicity of poor digestion is. Okay? And again, that's a whole other topic, but something, it's not culturally... I mean, we eat according to our culture. I've been to three or four different countries in the last month and they all eat differently, believe me. From China to Japan to France, they eat according to their palate. Well, your palate doesn't know poop about how to digest. Food combining is so important. I'll just give you a quick aside because I don't think it's elsewhere in the lecture. Dr. Ivan Pavlov, who won the Nobel Prize at the beginning of the 19th century, he was a digestive physiologist. And he got the bright idea to do something that sounded really grotesque called uh, open stomach, open dog stomach preparation. So you had living dogs with access to their stomachs. Uh, he would put into the dog's stomach pure carbohydrate, starch, and then see how long it took for the stomach to process that and then pass it through the pylorus. The starches took 60 to 90 minutes to do that. Then he took on another occasion and put in the ultimate in protein, ground up meat chips, and put it in the stomach. That took three hours. And we all know a protein diet sticks around in your stomach a whole lot more than, uh, than having some fruit or some carbohydrates. Now, here's the kicker. He then put the carbohydrate and the protein together. Does that sound familiar? Steak and potato? <laughs> uh, a, uh, a meat sandwich? Okay. How long do you think that food's hang around the stomach? Eight to nine hours. You will never, in a, well again, I know food eating is cultural, but you will never digest optimally if you make these food combinations. You ought to think in terms of what I call mono meals, all right? You know, have your thing in the morning, then maybe either have a little bit of protein with something compatible, a vegetable, and then have maybe some carbohydrates or something in the evening. But if you put them together, you will never digest optimally. Okay, so whenever you're dealing with a patient who's just not getting better, believe me, if you can force them, beat them with a brick bat, and get them to combine their foods correctly, they're going to get a whole lot better. Maybe not cured, but they'll get a whole lot better quickly. So. Big aside there. So you prevent new toxins from coming into the body. Makes sense. You try to neutralize pre-existing toxins that have accumulated in the body, number two. Number three, following this progress of logic, you try to excrete toxins in as non-toxic a fashion as possible. I say as non-toxic a fashion as possible because detoxification is always to a certain percentage degree retoxification. You mobilize the toxins out of one tissue and maybe a lot will get out and maybe a lot will poison the body on the way out. This is like uh, unmodified DMPS injections. You'll, you'll put out a boatload of toxins and you can sometimes bury the patient in the process as well. Number four, resolving infections and eliminating the reason for new infections. Number five, supplementing and eating optimally. Number six, addressing hormone imbalance, but most specifically, addressing hormone deficiencies. Never leave an abnormally low hormone level unaddressed. I'll give you the reasons why you'll never harm a patient that way, but you'll kill a lot of them if you don't. So, this then leads to my, what I call, primary twofold way to approach all disease. Number one, simplistically, you 
you seek to stop new oxidative stress. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, lost my damn clock. Oh, there it is. Okay. So number one, before that rude interruption, as a primary goal, you seek to stop new oxidative stress and repair old oxidative damage. Number two, you try to identify and eliminate all new sources of toxic exposure, whether they're from the outside or from the inside. And that's it. You can couch any treatment protocol in those terms and give yourself a sound foundation toward giving your patient an optimal treatment. Now, modern mainstream medicine does neither of these things. Okay? It, well, it doesn't even know toxins cause disease, but it, it certainly doesn't look to stop new toxins from coming in. When's the last time your intern has said, we gotta stop those toxins from coming in? <clears throat> and number two, when's the last time your internist or cardiologist said, we need to repair all the old oxidative damage in your body? No, all they do is say, you've got a headache, we need to treat it, we need to stop the headache. And I'm afraid, that's simplistic, but that's modern medicine. Now, complementary integrative medicine, they really just do number one. They try to repair old oxidative damage, but still, and this I hope is the point of my latest book, presentations like this, to really implant the realization that most disease is from unaddressed, new, ongoing, chronic, never stopping daily toxin exposures. And when you put on the fact and add to the fact that it's something that's completely occult, completely silence, silent, and if you don't specifically look for it, you won't find it. I mean, how many docs have a patient walk into their office and say, ah, you look like about a 325 blood sugar to me. No, you gotta do a blood test. How many docs say, you know, you look like how you have a horribly infected tooth in the left side of your mouth that I'm not going to be able to see on regular x-ray. No, you got to do the 3D x-ray. It has to be a routine part of a routine physical evaluation at any age. Because if you get a completely normal study, then you have a basis to look at when somebody develops their high blood pressure, their diabetes, their chest pain, their breast lump later on down the road, you can redo the 3D and see if a brand new chronic apical periodontitis, radiolucent space has suddenly popped up on a tooth. So very, very important. And incidentally, that's, that's the primary. I just gave you the conclusion of the presentation, but I'll, I'll repeat it later. So what are the primary sources of oral infection and toxicity? Well, root canal treated teeth. Uh, and also I'm going to present some information that's going to make my dear mentor, Dr. Hal Huggins, flip over several times in his grave. I'm not going to tell you root canals are good. I'll never tell you that. But I'll tell you we have some now conflicting stuff to show that some root canals are okay. But... The real problem, and I suggest this in the book, is trying to, construct study, trying to construct studies, and I make some suggestions as to what to construct, that, so that you can identify the clinically highly toxic root canals from those that we know there's 90-year-old people out there that have had a couple root canals for 30 years. What are they doing right or wrong? They didn't drop dead of a heart attack when they were 60. A lot of people do. And we clearly know that the more root canals you have in your mouth, the higher your statistical chance of heart disease. And we know that all heart attacks, well over 90%, have classical root canal and periodontal pathogens 
concentrated, concentrated in high concentration inside the blood clots that acutely cause the infarct. So this is something to be reckoned with, but sometimes we're faced with options, and I'll go over those options. So root canal treated teeth, other chronically infected teeth, which is the primary point of this presentation. I know you're a, a group of dentists, but let me just make sure we're on the same board. CAP is chronic apical periodontitis, a chronic large radiolucency around the apex of the tooth. So whenever I say CAP, that's what I'm talking about. Then, of course, we all know it, an acutely abscessed tooth is just horribly toxic. You know, you don't take one of those out, and if they're not dead of pain, they'll be dead of a heart attack five, five days later, so that has to be dealt with. And the biggie, chronic periodontal. I don't have it in this presentation. I have it in the book. The documentation that chronic periodontal disease has been linked with and often has studies to show it has a cause and effect relationship with virtually every chronic degenerative disease that's been studied. Okay. Gangrene, chronically infected tonsils, another biggie I won't have a chance to talk to, but I will tell you when you have chronically infected teeth in your mouth, root canals or otherwise, you've got chronically infected tonsils no matter how normal they look. And you might be able to deal with the patient if they have a normal C-reactive protein, if they're not elevating this index of systemic inflammation because the higher your CRP, the greater your chance of death from everything, all-cause mortality. You keep your CRP well below one, you'll live to be old and ugly. <laughs> Hopefully you're not ugly yet. I have a bizarre sense of humor, what can I say? Infected dental implants and toxic metals. So, my opinion is that in terms of overall public health, the primary reasons for most chronic degenerative diseases are root canal treated teeth with and without CAP. And this is one of the big ways in which I think most of you realize you can measure how badly a root canal might be affecting somebody is if it has a little tiny sliver of CAP and that's been stable for years, probably, probably that root canal is not horribly impacting their health. But if your root canal has a little sliver and then six months later it has a big old CAP, you better get that out of there. And don't do a repeat root canal because if it wasn't done properly the first time, you shouldn't subject the patient to another six to 12 months to a couple years of seeing whether or not they're going to do well with the second one. Number two, asymptomatic infected teeth, CAP, symptomatic, chronic gum disease, chronic infected tonsils. <clears throat> now, huh, my wonderful mentor, Dr. Huggins, and Dr. Uh, Boyd Haley got together early on in the mid-90s, and Dr. Haley was initially very much a skeptic of everything Dr. Huggins was doing, but he was open-minded, and he came to Dr. Huggins' conferences and listened to him, <laughs> and next thing you know, in Dr. Huggins' inimitable personal style, beat, doc <laughs> beat Dr. Haley into submission and got him to agree to start doing some studies. Well, they got together with dentists across the country, and over 5,000 root canals were extracted and sent to Dr. Haley. A mere 100% of them had incredibly potent toxins. And then we can see there are studies that show root canals have any of like 460 different types of not only bacteria, but viruses, but fungi, but protozoa, just every disgusting microorganism you can think of. So, <clears throat> why does a root canal, why is a root canal 100% like this? Well, number one, it's what I call a fatally flawed procedure because 
It's done for pain relief. I mean, a high volume endodontist will sort of lie to him or herself and say they disinfected or sterilized the tooth. That never happens. And even if it did, for the sake of argument, at the end of the procedure, they somehow rendered the tooth completely sterile, it won't stay sterile for more than a couple days at most because the immune system no longer has access to the dentinal tubules, which harbor the pathogens. Here's a biggie, too, and I don't think it's still well appreciated. A normal, healthy tooth has a outward-flowing fluid flush. It's always generating fluid and flushing it out. As soon as you do a root canal and nuke and take out the pulp, that fluid flow magically reverses. So you're chronically pulling the toxins and pathogens of the mouth into the, into the tooth. And that's why you would never maintain a sterile tooth, even if you achieved the unattainable goal of sterilizing it in the first place. Um, the best a root canal can do is debulk the infection and seal it off so well and this is where the expertise of the endodontist is important. I don't know how many of you are not endodontists and do root canals, but I would tell you, for the most part, you're doing a disservice if somebody, not only because they're getting a root canal, but because they're getting a root canal by somebody <clears throat> that does two a week rather than 30 a week. It's a, it's a very much procedure that if you're going to get an optimal sealing off and an optimal debulking, you need somebody that does a high volume. I don't think anybody wants somebody that's done three brain surgeries operating on their brain. You want somebody that's done a couple thousand. Uh, the molars and the larger teeth. I liken this to a syringe and an IV. Matter of fact, it's a better way to deliver pathogens and toxins throughout your body than if you started an IV with a butterfly and pushed it IV. Because not only do you squeeze toxins from your molars directly into the blood, you also push them directly into the lymphatics. So it's doubly effective as just an IV injection. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the heart, a lot about the heart, the point being is, at first blush, you might wonder, how is it that pathogens from the mouth and toxins, the first place they set up shop is the coronary arteries? I mean, number one, you're starting in the veins. Number two, you're ending up in the arteries. Number three, you're not seemingly going much anywhere else in the body. Pretty straightforward. You chew. You squeeze the toxins and pathogens out into the venous blood. Now, what does the venous blood have comparable to the arterial blood? Or that's not comparable. Very low pressure. You know, a couple millimeters of mercury. The artery has a minimum of 120. Now, most people a lot higher than that. So, without that high pressure, they stay in the lumen. And they go through the veins, finally drain, go up into the pulmonary system, go into the pulmonary arteries, still low pressure, pulmonary arteries down into the left atrium, still low pressure, then down into the left ventricle, and then the left ventricle goes kaboom. And you go from 4 millimeters of mercury to 140 millimeters of mercury, and the coronary arteries get 25% of the cardiac output, so they go into the coronary artery and into the endothelium. And that's why that's the first place that gets hammered, even though physiologically and anatomically, the coronary arteries are quite remote from the mouth. And then, as we'll see, it's more emphasized in the books, but I'm going to cover it here, and I didn't put it in the title. Dental infections cause cause directly greater than 90% of all heart attacks. Dental infections cause greater than 70% of all breast cancers. Now guess what? We just covered heart attacks and breast cancers. Guess what the vast majority of the entire planet dies from? 
heart attacks, and breast cancer. Forget about everything else if you want. A majority of the, a strong majority of the people on this planet die of a heart attack or breast cancer. So, a root canal is always highly toxic but variably toxic. Unique flora and big molar. If you have a root canal and an incisor, they tend not to be as big a deal because, look, you don't chew on an incisor. You nip something off and then you grind away with the molars. So you're not having the physical pressure. Uh, containment, that has to do with your general state of health. You know, if you're an older osteoporotic person, you're going to contain an infection much more poorly anywhere in your bone, but also in your mouth and elsewhere in your body. Uh, how long is it been present? Hormonal status? You can see the other. Now, let's get into discussion about chronic, chronic apical periodontitis. Uh, also known as grossly infected tooth. You don't get the x-ray picture of apical periodontitis until the tooth is dead. It's over with, it's necrotic, it's dead. So whether it's hurting you or is hurting the patient or not, if you see apical periodontitis on an x-ray, that's a dead tooth. It's very frequently as we all know, a sequel to endodontic infection. And when you do uh, 3D x-ray examinations of any root canal, depending on how well you interpret the 3D x-ray, you'll usually have a minimum of 95% of those root canals with some degree of apical periodontitis. Not, not necessarily a gross radiolucency, but they'll always have a little sliver. But as I said before, if that sliver stays stable on long-term follow-up examinations and, 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 and your patient maintains a CRP less than one, you've probably got a root canal that's not immediately, and I say immediately because things can change, immediately threatening your patient's health. But other factors can come into play, hormone imbalance, and all of a sudden, that previously contained infection just pops its britches and goes all over the place. So all of these things need to be chronically followed. And I would submit to you, they should be followed just as diligently by the dentist in long-term follow-up as by the internist or cardiologist in long-term follow-up. This was very interesting, uh, just to get a little esoteric for a moment, but to perhaps hammer home, home a point that chronic apical periodontitis always, 100% of the time, means a chronically infected, physiologically dead tooth. They have these interesting animal models that they do research on, and one of them is called the germ-free rat. And most of us think of rats as being pretty germy, but apparently they designed one that didn't have any. Well, when they take these germ-free rats who supposedly have a, this is amazing, supposedly have a sterile oral cavity, and they just gouge out down to the pulp. So they immediately expose the pulp openly and chronically in the absence of exogenous outside germs, no CAP develops. So chronic apical periodontitis always, always, always results from chronic infection, and by the time you see the radiolucency, the tooth is dead. And it needs to be extracted, extracted and implanted, maybe if the patient absolutely insists that extraction is not an option, and we run into patients like that, then an expertly done root canal by an endodontist, after which you can document no CAP post-procedure, no CAP six months post-procedure, and a solidly normal CRP, you can let it be for a while. But if that CRP comes up, that radiolucency grows, 
then you come in with your patient with a brick hammer and say, I got to give it to you straight. You want to drop dead of a heart attack or you want to get rid of the damn tooth? And of course, how our patients want to do things, what their economics are, what their desires are, are obviously all factors in how they need to be treated. Now some, in regular x-ray, root canal treated teeth, you see CAP 40 to 70 percent of the time. As I said before, uh, this was an extremely interesting study because it looked at the same 46 root canal treated teeth. And in one case, it did regular Panorex, in the other case, it did 3D. And the same interpreters looked at all the data. In the, um, in the 2D, they saw it 70% of the time. In an identical teeth on 3D, they saw it 91% of the time. So right away, you can see, even when done expertly, even when interpreted expertly, there's going to be a minimum of a 20% loss of diagnosis of severely infected teeth no matter what you saw in the Panorex. And the, the picture on the cover of the book that you'll see later on if you get a copy was the first one that I ran into, and that's my friend from January of 2016. I mean, I'm not a dentist, but I've looked at a lot of dental x-rays. I've looked at a lot of other x-rays, and I don't see Jack on the 2D, which you see, and when you look at the 3D, you see the most incredibly grossly infected tooth eroding away the bone into the sinus. So this is significant stuff. And this is more for my medical audiences. All of you know what a uh, CAP looks like. And there's, of course, the typical root canal. And here's one with obviously an extremely horribly infection and the CAP at both root tips. Now let's look at some data. And believe me, the literature has a lot of it when you stop and, as they say, there's a lot of information hiding in plain sight. I, I, gotta, I gotta just get on my soapbox a little bit here and say that the best way to have an exciting medical slash dental discovery and bury it forever is to put it in the mainstream literature. <laughs> it's only when you take the time to write a book and promote the book that anybody finds out about it. So they have a nice study looking at CAP and chronic coronary artery disease looking at 103 patients with coronary angiography, 65% had CAD, 42% had CAP, and the patients with CAP had nearly a threefold higher incidence of coronary artery disease. So this was one simple study. Well, it's simple. I'm sure it wasn't involved. But it was independently associated CAP with coronary artery disease. Now, I'm going to take this opportunity to slam my fellow cardiologists. It's now recognized in the medical literature, in the cardiology literature, and just about any literature you can find, that inflammation of the coronary artery lining is the primary cause for initiating and evolving atherosclerosis. And they consider atherosclerosis to be a chronic inflammatory disease. Well, it's like layers of the onion. If you stop at the third layer, what's at the fourth layer? Does anybody really think that inflammation just spontaneously develops for no reason at all? Inflammation only develops when you consume antioxidants, inflammation is a synonym for focal vitamin C deficiency. 
And when you inflame something, it means you're consuming the antioxidants. What consumes antioxidants? Prooxidants or toxins. What produces almost all the toxins that we're exposed to? Infections. Okay? As, again, my wonderful mentor, who I consider to be the founder of biological dentistry, although he never actually assumed that label, knowing his ego, I'm sure he would have loved to. <laughs> God bless you, Hal. And he deserved it. I used to have these conversations with Hal, and you had to know Hal. I mean, he had the driest, most sarcastic sense of humor you ever heard in your life. And I was once talking to him that uh, just about diseases in general and toxins and everything else, and I must have said something stupid because Hal looked at me and said, Tom, you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. I said, what the hell does that mean, Hal? <laughs> Obviously, if toxins are causing all your damage and you haven't addressed the ongoing new flood of toxins coming in, how are you going to really resolve the disease? So how the hell are you going to dry off while water is still drowning you in the shower? Simple, elegant, to the point. Now, what data do we have, and we have a lot of it, that the inflammation in the coronary artery does not just spontaneously appear? Certainly, we have countless articles now showing the association, the correlation. I hate those terms, but sometimes it's accurate to use them, of periodontal disease and coronary artery disease. And periodontal disease has long been established to be an independent risk factor for coronary artery disease. But why? It's almost like it's been obvious all along, but they just didn't have the studies. Okay. Now, I mentioned that inflammation is focal scurvy. And coronary artery disease and atherosclerosis is primarily ends up being an immune response that runs amok. The inflammation keeps on bringing in inflammatory cells, but the reason for the inflammation never stops. So the inflammation just brings in immune cells forever. And the immune cells ultimately result in the growth of the atherosclerotic plaque and the heart attack. Now, I mentioned inflammation as focal scurvy. Guess what the first white blood cell, immune cell, is to show up in the coronary artery? The monocyte. Guess what the monocyte has more than any other immune cell in the body? Vitamin C. 80-fold, 8,000% more vitamin C than the surrounding plasma. I would submit to you that Inflammation is focal scurvy, so what does an area acutely depleted of vitamin C need more than anything else? Vitamin C. And that's the first cell. So I submit to you that the immune cell, that the immune response very largely is a way that the body tries to compensate for vitamin C depleted areas in the body. Now, there have been a host of studies that have actually chopped up plaque and looked at them, and the DNA of oral pathogens typical for root canals and gum infection is consistently found inside the plaque. But well, what the heck are oral pathogens doing inside an atherosclerotic plaque? What they're doing is they're the cause of the atherosclerosis. And they've had other studies where they core out the plaque with a process called atherectomy, which is cardiovascular rotor-rooter. And then they analyze that, and they have identified well over 50 different species of pathogens, nearly all oral. Okay, now here's the smoking gun study. Incidentally, I have trouble. I, I, I've said, I said smoking gun in Japan. I said smoking gun in France. I said smoking gun in China. 
and I don't think the translator managed to transmit to them what I was saying, so I'll, I'll have to limit smoking gun to my English-speaking audiences of the future. <clears throat> Dr. Pessy in uh, Finland has a unique institution where there's a large amount of clinicians in a hospital and there's a large amount of research and research laboratories at the same institution, so wonderful for research. Somebody got the brilliant idea, and it was a brilliant idea, to ask the cardiologist to do the angiograms on acute MI patients because you virtually always have an acutely blocked off blood vessel. And the acutely blocked off blood vessel is usually a large atherosclerotic plaque with an acute platelet clot blocking off the rest of the lumen. So the cardiologist went in there, suctioned out the blood clots, and then sent the blood clots off to Dr. Pesci and her group. And they did polymerase chain reaction testing, which detects very tiny amounts of nucleic acid. And in 101 patients, they found root canal type pathogens, 78%, periodontal, 35%. So that adds up to well over 100%. So I extrapolated it as being at least 90% of all heart attacks coming from pathogens generated in the mouth. Now, if you still don't think it's cause and effect, look at the next sentence. The total amount of DNA found in the clots was 16-fold higher, 1,600% higher than the concentration in the surrounding plasma. So surely you don't think that somebody had a heart attack with a sterile blood clot, and then all these oral pathogens came in and started concentrating inside the plaque. Of course not. The oral pathogens concentrated. This increased the oxidative stress astronomically in the platelets. The platelets clumped together. The blood clot formed and the heart attack developed. So this study, in my humble opinion, is definitive proof that over 90% of all heart attacks are directly caused by dental pathogens. These same uh, pathogens were looked for, and they did some studies on, that looked at what they call aortic atherosclerotic burden. Basically, they're talking about atherosclerosis, a lot more visible inside the aorta. Now, they looked at teeth with CAP that had not uh, received root canals, and they looked at CAP teeth that had received root canals. And this, interestingly, is, you know, one of the studies that would upset Hal greatly. But it did show that, statistically speaking, a root canal treated tooth was less toxic than an untreated CAP tooth. Now, that doesn't mean it's not toxic. It just really points out more how horribly toxic a silent, undiagnosed, untreated CAP tooth is. <clears throat> Now, the conclusion then by this study, at least the conclusion as I interpret it, is that asymptomatic CAP teeth would be expected to have an even greater negative impact on the coronaries and on chronic degenerative disease in general than the root canal treated tooth. And I want to say this because I don't have a slide on it. It's all in the book. There's only so much time I have here, is that there's a very large number of studies that show mild to moderate periodontal or gum disease is direct, directly related to oh, at least 50 or 60 different chronic degenerative diseases. Basically, every disease that they studied, it showed a correlation. Now, these mild to moderately infected gums have the same flora as the root canal treated tooth because they often lead to the CAP for which the root canal is done. And so they have the same flora as the CAP tooth. So every study that you see, and there are tons of them that show gum disease is related to this chronic degenerative disease, means the CAP tooth is tenfold more associated with that disease than the gum disease. At the very least, it has the same relationship. And 
you all are familiar with this pathology. It's not like I'm talking to a bunch of general practitioners, but I have to <laughs> design these for everybody. So, CAP. Now, this was the stuff that blew me away. And we, I humbly submit, we'll see if it blows you away. After I saw my friend have her hugely infected asymptomatic tooth, I said, I wonder how common this is. And I even talked to some of my dental colleagues, a couple that truly I hold in higher esteem than anybody else intellectually, and I said, do you think a tooth this badly abscessed will be asymptomatic? I said, no, no way, no way. It'll... So, well, I don't know, let me check. Okay, we have right here a bunch of studies. One using just regular x-ray. Remember regular x-ray, not 3D. 4,500 teeth in 206 adults. Nearly 7% of those teeth demonstrated CAP. Straight teeth, not teeth that had root canals. 40% showed root canals, uh, showed CAP associated with root canals. Now, when you consider the fact of underinterpretation, along with these other factors, this meant that 10 to 15 percent of all teeth examined had some CAP. And also consider the fact, although it's not data that's generated by this study, most of the incisors and cuspids that don't do a lot of chewing, relatively speaking, they rarely get CAP. This means this could be 20 to 25 percent when you're thinking you're really mostly talking about the premolars and molars. So I submit to you, and I'll show you some more data, this is why people are sick. This is why people stay sick. This is why angioplasties don't cure disease. This is why diabetes never goes away. This is why once you have arthritis, you've got arthritis for life. This is why all chronic disease stays chronic. And it's beyond the scope of this, but I can tell you when you can identify these foci, and I saw this a lot with Huggins, take quality supplementation. As the title of the book says, you can cure the incurable. Now, Another study, regular x-ray found CAP, 9% of 120,000 teeth. Again, very close to that 40%, 39%. But again, when we compare the incidence of 2D and 3D, this means as much as 20% of teeth. So conservatively, conservatively, and this is still a huge amount when you consider the fact that the incisors are going to rare, very rarely be impacted, at least 7% of all, pe of all teeth in all adults in every country, because I looked at about 20 different countries, they all had these statistical prevalent studies have chronically infected teeth. But you don't know until you look for it. And doing a regular x-ray is going to miss it much to most of the time. They also showed that when you have CAP on an x-ray, you not only have coronary artery disease develop, you develop it more rapidly. And not a surprise thing because the size of the radiolucency also relates to higher amounts of endotoxins being generated. <clears throat> I mentioned this briefly at the start. Let me make this point very clear in our esteemed JAMA we found that individuals who reported having two or more root canal treated teeth were statistically more likely to have coronary artery disease, excuse me, coronary artery disease. So I think it's very easily to see that this could be extrapolated to the CAP as well. And just a little medical legal statement I want to make here. I have a, a little legal background, haven't done much with it, but let me just read it to you. All dental patients should be made aware of this study, this specific study, 
uh, in their informed consents before receiving a root canal, if that's being decided to do. Otherwise, the consent is not really informed, and eventually, maybe not right now, but eventually, legal liability for the dentist can be expected to increase over time as this connection between heart attacks and infected teeth is progressively better known. I mean, if you have a savvy patient with a savvy lawyer, you could be sued right now for just doing a root canal and that patient having a heart attack and them not knowing about this study in their informed consent. Just say it. Now, the same seeding of the, of the arteries is also seen in the, uh, uh, in the cerebrovascular arteries, and they found a strong relationship. The same group that looked at the blood clots in the coronary arteries also looked at ruptured aneurysms and found not as high a percentage as in the coronary arteries, but maybe 60% of aneurysms had the same pathogen profile from the mouth. They also looked very interestingly, I don't know why they did this, I, I would never have thought to do this study, but they turned out to have a fascinating result. Even when you don't have a pericardial effusion, the fluid around your heart, you still have a physiological amount of fluid. Lubricates the heart so it doesn't develop friction inside the chest. They decided to look at pericardial fluid in post-mortem patients and found that a sizable majority of them had evidence of the same pathogens and that the worse the coronary artery disease was, the greater the amount of DNA was found in the pericardial fluid. Okay. <clears throat> now, let's look at infected teeth and cancer. Amazon will probably say it's not available and they'll do a search for it and you'll go to some old bookseller and eventually find it, but I would encourage you to look for it. They have a book out there called Cancer, A Second Opinion, written by Dr. Joseph Issels. One brilliant fella. I, I suppose, I don't know, this is a supposition. I suppose he knew all about Weston Price because Otherwise, he thought about some stuff all on his own, and he's an even greater genius than what I'm saying. He operated a clinic in Germany in the 50s, 50s, where he treated advanced metastatic cancer patients who had been chemotherapized, had all their resources drained, left up for dead, and finally they showed up at his clinic for treatment. And he had a auto vaccine therapy that he would generate from the patient to direct against the cancer cells. And it was quite effective. But he noted 98%. Now let me tell you something. If you're dealing with studies that say 98%, they just didn't find the other 2%. 98% means 100%, okay? But I'll leave it at 98% and you can decide what happened to the other 2%. 98% of his patients had, in his words, this is a direct quote from the book, between 2 and 10 dead teeth. He categorized the root canal as a dead tooth. Now, guess what? He didn't have 3D x-ray. That's why I say, I guarantee you, the other 2% had some dead teeth too. But anyway... Part of his protocol was to uh, remove those teeth, which he did, and he later found out that a significant number of patients in the course of their therapy still ended up dying from heart attacks. And I, again, I don't know what planted this idea in his head because he noted, and again, it's fascinating reading, that almost everybody had normal appearing tonsils. Not ugly, gross tonsillitis looking tonsils, normal tonsils. Somehow he figured out that having all these dead teeth in the mouth must be infecting those tonsils. And if he did, he was exactly right because he started including routine tonsillectomy on these patients. And according to him, 100% of the tonsils were grossly infected, 100%. Okay, 
I've said in the past, the tonsil is something uh, designed as a protector, but it becomes the infector. It's designed to deal with wimpy, low-grade infections in the mouth, process them and deal with it. When you have a root canal or another chronically infected tooth draining into that tonsil nonstop, that tonsil is history. And once you get rid of the infected tooth, the tonsil cannot heal itself. We're seeing now that maybe some direct ozone injections might do that. That remains to be seen. Oh, so anyway, he started doing tonsillectomies and nobody got heart attacks anymore. And I'm running short on time, but I'll tell you, a chronically infected tonsil just about did me in from a root canal I had 20 years ago. And the root canal had been extracted and my tonsil looked fine. I got chest pain. I had read Issel's book. My CRP was four or five. And I said, you better get your damn tonsils out. And I went to the ENT. And he said, and I, and I made sure I went online and found out what the history was for chronic tonsillitis. I said, I'm tired of this damn tonsillitis. They've settled down right now, so get them out. Okay. Well, in case you don't know, surgeons don't need much of an excuse to do surgery. <laughs> so he yanked them out, came and saw me after the procedure. Of course, he didn't know any of this stuff. I didn't bother him with all these details. And he said, I saw something interesting, Tom. He said, what's that? He said, well, when I grabbed the tonsil on the left side of your mouth, that was the side where the root canal had been on 10 years earlier, post-extraction, he said, pus started coming out. My CRP came down, my chest pain stopped. I got a study six months later. It had near normal coronary arteries. So these things will bury you, and they'll bury you fast. Now, the draining lymphatics. I talked about breast cancer. Well, we, we see this on thermography. People with dental infections and root canals, you can see the red lines coming down from their jaws right on into their breasts. They have an extensive area of shared lymphatics between the head, mouth, neck, and breasts, okay? And even though lymphatics are supposed to be unidirectional, like anything else, once they have enough toxicity and pathogens, they start sloshing and they become bidirectional. And everything going on inside your mouth ends up in your breasts. Now, And although it's not quite as elegant as Dr. Pesci's study, we actually have some more direct data on the breast and breast cancer. There's one periodontal pathogen known as Fusobacterium, specifically studied, the very recent study, 2016. Fusobacterium is significantly enriched in breast tissue from women with malignant disease. How much more straightforward can you get than that? What the hell is a damn dental pathogen doing inside your breasts other than raking havoc? Same pathogen, highly carcinogenic pathogen. What do you do all day with the saliva in your mouth? You swallow it. And in fact, this same pathogen has been strongly linked to cancer in the gut and a primary factor in malignant transformation in uh, intestinal, in large intestinal tumors as well. So I would submit to you in many women, chronically infected teeth cause much of the breast tissue to be continuously suffused by lymph containing oral pathogen and their related toxins. And any physician who doesn't look at the mouth when their patient has chest pain, when their patient has a breast lump, don't wait for it to be breast cancer. They're not only missing the cause of those conditions most of the time, they're missing the primary, in my opinion, only real significant chance that patient has for a cure. And when you take out 
when you turn off the shower, as Dr. Huggins says, you got a great chance at cure. Don't buy all this garbage about all these diseases being incurable. They're incurable because we don't turn off the faucet. It's that simple. So, I submit to you, as regular panorex mouth x-rays miss a lot of pathology, 3D digital x-rays of the mouth need to become an integral part of the routine baseline evaluation, not just don't wait until somebody has heart disease. Uh, actually, I got five more, but I'll, I'll, I could wrap it up in 10. <laughs> uh, should become a routine baseline evaluation of any examination, because even if you don't have chest pain, wonderful if you don't have chest pain. If you're a 25-year-old kid getting a physical evaluation for uh, physical education, this should be part of it, just as readily as a biochem panel looking at your blood sugar should be part of it. You don't, want to wait, you don't want to wait 20 years to know that your blood sugar was 180, and you don't want to wait 20 years to know that you're already developing CAP on one or more teeth. But it's asymptomatic. So you won't know if you don't look for it, and you can't tell if somebody has diabetes just by looking at them. You can't tell somebody has CAP on an untreated tooth just by looking at them. So, all of you are pretty familiar with the Panorex, and this is the type of grotesque pathology you'll often see, not always, I mean, Panorex will pick up some stuff, but, and, and, this, and a similar picture like this is on the cover of the book from my friend, this was the type of pathology that she had that you could not see could not see, I challenge you to see it, you could not see this level of pathology on the panorex. And nothing could be more grotesque than completely eroding away the sinus wall, the sinus filling. You could probably see a little of the substance in her sinus because she had chronic sinusitis, which incidentally, infected CAP teeth underlie a significant majority of chronic sinusitis. So the ENT doctor that doesn't include this is missing the game too. Okay, but again, as Dennis, if somebody telling you I'm always blowing my nose, I'm always doing this, I mean, obviously I'm telling you, you should do a 3D on everybody. But if that doesn't work out economically for you, whatever, this, that, or the other, if somebody has sinusitis symptoms, you got to do it. So, sort of put things in a capsule. CAP teeth with and without root canal treatments due to their extraordinary ability to deplete antioxidants and promote chronic inflammation can be considered the primary cause of heart attacks and the primary cause of most cancers, especially breast cancer. Going back to the start of this, and again, it's in the book, I don't have time for everything of significance, but it's very clear cut that when you look at systemic inflammation, of which periodontal disease strongly promotes, systemic inflammation as measured by elevations of CRP, you have increased all-cause mortality, okay? What could be more important than addressing a factor that increases your chance of death from everything? Something that affects every cell in your body. Now, I told you there's some root canals out there that don't put people six feet under. Why is that? Okay, Dr. Broda Barnes looked at about 1,600 patients over a 20-year period Back in the 1970s, he was an expert on thyroid function, so he corrected their thyroid function almost perfectly with desiccated thyroid. And think about this now, 1,600 older patients, they smoked, they drank, they had diabetes, they undoubtedly had tons of root canals, statistically speaking. They undoubtedly have tons of CAP since we've just seen the data 
but by doing nothing else other than perfectly adjusting the thyroid function, over a 20-year period, he saw four heart attacks, all in men. If you look at the Framingham studies, this should have been 75. And then later, he had a whole bunch of men drop out of the study, and about 30 of them promptly had heart attacks. What does this mean? This means that perfect thyroid function helps you wall off infections. It helps infections keep from disseminating. Never underestimate the importance of the thyroid function. Very, don't look at regular thyroid tests. They mean nothing. Regular thyroid tests measure hyperthyroidism and very severe hypothyroidism. They do nothing for the subtle hypothyroidism of which we have an enormous epidemic across the world. Inside the gland, the gland produces T4, which is inactive. You need to make it into T3. Well, guess what? 80% of the T4 is converted to T3 outside of the thyroid gland. And what is it converted? By deiodinases inside every cell in your body. What inactivates enzymes? Oxidation. So it's like a chicken and egg thing. The more inflammation you have, the more these deiodinases are inactivated, and even though the thyroid appears normal, you've got jack for thyroid function in the cells of your body. And what you do is you measure T3 and reverse T3. Reverse T3 is the blank key to the lock. It does nothing, but it accumulates the more oxidative stress you have. You need a certain ratio of active T3 to inactive T3. That ratio is roughly 18 to 21 over 1. But if you're not measuring reverse T3 and calculating these ratios, if you're an endocrinologist, if you're a med student, you don't know anything what's going on with the patient's general thyroid status. So, Asymptomatic CAP, which is the vast majority, I'm willing to say now, based on the studies that I've looked at, that a horribly infected tooth is asymptomatic 97, 98% of the time. These things are very rarely symptomatic. It's the most undiagnosed yet most important direct cause of heart disease, breast cancer, and other chronic degenerative diseases. You absolutely have to look for it. It's not going to slap you upside the head. You've got to look for it. And it's the primary cause, the primary cause of heart disease, cancer, and chronic degenerative disease across the world today. So everybody needs a 3D, and it needs to be a mand mandatory part of the evaluation. And that's about it. Thank you. Where do, where do I place it? Where do you place the third molar schema costume combinations that we see all the time? And it scratches like this. You mean cavitations? Yeah, cavitations. Uh, cavitations get real important the bigger they get and the lousier the defense system is of the patient. A lot of, and we know this clinically, small cavitations that are very focal. Uh, for all intents and purposes, do nothing to the generalized health. On the other hand, when they start growing, spreading, metastasizing, breaking down new bone, they can become just as toxic as a CAP tooth. So you, all, you have the whole gradation from no clinical impact to major clinical impact. Thank you. Sure. Oh. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.